briefly, I'll tell you, uh, Radley uh, is a senior writer and investigative reporter for the Huffington Post, where he covers civil liberties and the criminal justice system. He uh, writes about music and culture in Nashville, Tennessee, where he lives as well. He's a former senior editor for Reason Magazine, where his weekly column and investigative features were finalists for and won a number of journalism awards. Uh, he's, his 2009 investigative report on expert witness fraud in a Louisiana death penalty case won the Western Publication Association's Maggie Award for reporting. In 2011, The Week named Balco a <coughs> finalist for Opinion Columnist of the Year, and the LA Press Club named him Journalist of the Year. He's also, his work has actually been cited by the United States Supreme Court in Hudson versus Michigan, and cited and uh, excerpted by the Mississippi State Supreme Court as well. His extensive reporting on controversial Mississippi medical examiner Stephen Hain helped win a new trial and an acquittal for a 13-year-old murder suspect, Tyler Edmonds, and eventually to Haines' termination. His new book, Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, has won widespread praise, including from The Economist, The New Yorker, Wall Street Journal, Publ Publishers Weekly, and The New York Journal of Books. Uh, briefly, Balco's book deals with one of the most important but often ignored amendments of the United States Constitution, and that's the Third Amendment. And he goes into great detail in his book about the Third Amendment and what he refers to as a symbolic Third Amendment. In, in America, we've taken great pride uh, in there certain institutional safeguards in the fact that our civilian and military authorities are distinct and operate within distinct spheres. Balco, in his book, mentions uh, how that line between civilian and military and between soldier and police officer is steadily blurring. And it endangers our liberties as citizens and is something that we should all be concerned about. In fact, the Alabama Constitution, Article 1, Section 28, the Declaration of Rights, which was uh, from 1901, but actually dates back to Alabama's statehood in 1819, has a strong preference for and uh, institutional safeguard, as I mentioned, against housing, um, quartering of soldiers in, the, in homes. And once again, in Balco mentions this, that's one of the, the purpose behind uh, this particular, and it's also mentioned in our Third Amendment to the United States Constitution, uh, the reason or the impetus or reason behind those particular provisions is that to protect, to protect civilians and to protect our liberties and to keep the military out of domestic affairs. Um, the Third Amendment to the United States Constitution is often called the Forgotten Amendment. There's been no United States Supreme Court directly on point that's ever addressed it. Several of the circuits, including the Second Circuit and Tenth Circuit, have addressed it. And uh, the Griswold United States Supreme Court briefly referenced it, but there's been no real uh, adjudication, of, probably because of the language is so clear. In fact, the, because of that, and the, it's never been really cited, uh, as I said, as a main authority or really challenged, it's often been deemed anachronistic and forgotten. Many of you may have heard recently of this Blue Ribbon Fact, well, Blue Ribbon Constitutional Revision uh, Commission, which formed by joint, uh, Alabama Senate Joint Resolution. It created this Constitutional Commission, and it consists of, uh, among other people, the Governor, the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Temp of the Senate. And they were been tasked, this, uh, this committee, with going article by article through and making uh, recommendations to the legislature to change or fix Alabama's uh, perceived, in many instances, broken and anachronistic constitution. One of the most important changes that they recommended, and almost uh, went, not many people even challenged it or were really concerned about it, but they dealt with Article One, Section 28. And that's, that's the provision of, like I said, it's been in Alabama's constitution in one way or another since 1819, uh, when we first became a state, that no, soldier, that no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. And that, as I said, is a constitutional, uh, not only in the federal constitution, but in the state of Alabama, and it really dates back, and Balco talks about this, to 1689 and the English Bill of Rights. Uh, and it's been there that long. It's almost become ingrained. It has become ingrained in our nation's psyche, and it's part of the American spirit that uh, this, the uh, 
civil authorities be able to be separate and apart from uh, the, uh, the military. And it, it, this really evidences the founders' aversion to an internal standing army. And uh, the symbolic Third Amendment, which Balco would talk about tonight, uh, a prohibition on peacetime quartering, but it really is a more robust expression of the threat of standing armies posed to societies. And that's uh, what this Section 28 has, uh, has really embodies. But the most remarkable thing is that the, uh, this commission recommended, they recommended that that provision be deleted from the Alabama Constitution. Their comments to that and the recommendation, that the, re the grounds for that reason, the grounds for the deletion was that this prohibition, which grew out of complaints of the colonists against King George III, may now be anachronistic. I think that's quite a remarkable recommendation by this commission, and, and none of the citizens seem to be concerned about it at all. And I would strongly encourage many of you to look at uh, New Orleans during Katrina to see this uh, constitution, the primacy of this constitutional provision where state troopers and military personnel entered people's homes without warrants, without probable cause, in many instances unlawfully, to seize firearms. And especially in, in where we are now, uh, I can see that definitely becoming an issue during times of emergency, which seems to be far too often under our governors, especially during times of storms or perceived crises. crises. Um, Radley also talked about some of the most important uh, safeguards, uh, the Castle Doctrine, and uh, no-knock raids and the rise of SWAT, the SWAT team, and uh, how, the SWAT, how SWAT teams used to be almost a measure of last resort and um, bordered, uh, in many instances, uh, uh, these were designed to do, these these SWAT teams were designed to deal with riots, and nowadays SWAT teams they've exploded, and many of these SWAT teams are engaging in the most banal and regular law enforcement uh, raids on misdemeanor drug houses, on misdemeanors, uh, oftentimes clad in military gear and personnel made uh, all made possible by federal grants and encouraged by a. Uh, a winner-take-all uh, asset forfeiture program which tends to just uh, repeatedly cause constitutional concerns. So I'm going to get off my box now, but uh, Radley really touches on some very important issues and uh, hopefully after tonight we'll send a copy of this video and uh, his book to members of the commission to explain uh, just how important uh, Section 20 it is in the Third Amendment to our Constitution. Please join me. <laughs> yes, that's right. All right, please join me in welcoming Radley Balkan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matt, and thanks for the uh, Federal Society for inviting me to, uh, to, to chat with you all tonight. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to show you this video. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's disturbing, as you might see there, uh, especially if you're a, uh, a dog person as I am. Um, but let me set it up real quick. Um, but this was in Columbia, Missouri uh, a few years ago, 2011, I believe this raid took place. Um, they got, the police got it a, a uh, anonymous tip that there was drug activity in this house. Uh, they did what they call a trash pull, uh, which they can do without a warrant. They found what they described as marijuana residue in the trash, and that uh, was their, their probable cause for, about what, for, for what you're about to see in this video. Oh, I didn't check the volume. Hopefully we're good. Then. I'd encourage you to count how many seconds between uh, when the police announce themselves and you hear the first gunshot. And imagine you're sort of asleep in the back bedroom, uh, if, you know, and this is happening to you. There's the first gunshot. You 
going to see an eight-year-old get shuffled out of the house here in a minute that they didn't, they weren't aware was in the house. You can stop. I'll, I'll spare you the, full, the whole video. Um, but so they found, uh, ironically enough, uh, marijuana had been decriminalized in Colombia, still is. Uh, so they found a, a small bag of pot in the bedroom, uh, but under Colombia law, it wasn't actually enough to even charge the guy with the misdemeanor. Um, they did find a pipe near the marijuana, which the way the drug laws work, uh, if the pipe had been anywhere in the, else in the house, it would have been perfectly legal, but because they found it near the pot that they couldn't charge him for, they could charge him uh, for, uh, on a paraphernalia charge for having the pipe. Uh, basically, he got a $250 fine. Um, but that, what you just saw was the result of basically uh, they found residue in the trash, and that's what, that was how they responded to finding residue in the trash. Um, I uh, had heard about this, uh, or I had heard that there was video of this raid. I tried to get it from the police department. Um, I would heard that they were, they were actually recording their raids for training purposes. Um, and uh, I couldn't get it from them. Uh, finally, the local newspaper in Columbia filed an open records request and threatened to go to court, and they got a copy of the video. I posted the video online. Uh, within about a week, it went viral. Uh, I think it now has over 2 million YouTube uh, uh, views. But the reaction from people to the video, I thought, was pretty astounding. I've been writing about this issue for about seven or eight years, um, and people were uh, angry and livid at what they saw in this video. Uh, the Columbia Police Department, they had to shut down their phone lines and their email. Uh, they got death threats. Uh, the video sort of went around the world, basically. Uh, and I remember specifically one night, I, I knew it was going to be on, so I watched. And I remember watching uh, Fox News, and Bill O'Reilly was talking about the video, uh, and he had brought on uh, apparently noted police tactics expert Charles Krauthammer uh, <laughs> to, to, to comment on the video. And Krauthammer said uh, to O'Reilly, he said, you know, don't, don't judge the drug war based on this video. These are just some rogue cops. You know, this is an isolated incident. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't dismiss the drug war because of what you see in this video. And, you know, Krauthammer was 100% wrong. Um, in fact, the only thing that's really unusual about this video is the fact that it was recorded and the video was released. Uh, everything from the relatively uh, little probable cause uh, to the fact that it was done at night, the battering ram, uh, shooting the dog, which is almost perfunctory in a lot of these raids, uh, the fact that they didn't know there was a kid in the house, that they did it at night, um, all these, none of these things are unusual. Um, raids like the one you just saw happen about 150 times a day in this country. Uh, and to me, as somebody who had been covering this for a while, I thought I found the reaction, the angry reaction to it, uh, sort of encouraging, uh, because it was almost as if, uh, you know, a new, the internet generation at least, uh, was seeing for the first time how the drug war is actually being fought on the ground, uh, and they were not at all happy at what they were seeing. Uh, and it has sort of convinced me, I think, uh, it, this is a very cynical talk I'm going to give tonight, but uh, if there is some hope, I think it is that as people are made more aware of what's going on and, and what sorts of tactics our police departments are using, um, I, uh, people tend to get pretty upset about it uh, on all sides of the political spectrum, actually. Uh, and I do find that encouraging. I think a lot of it's just a matter of awareness. Um, can we uh, launch the PowerPoint, if you wouldn't mind, there? So, <clears throat> see if this uh, awesome. All right. Uh, so I'm going to give you another quick anecdote to kind of lead off the talk tonight. Uh, this is Katherine Johnston. Uh, she's a 90... Uh, well, she, uh, that's, that was the story initially. Um, so this is a, she was a 92-year-old woman, lived in a rough neighborhood in Atlanta. Uh, the, the week of Thanksgiving 2006, there was a narcotics unit from the Atlanta Police Department out in an SUV. Uh, they saw a guy walking along the side of the road that they had arrested on drug charges uh, several times before. They jumped out on him, threw him on the ground, put a gun to his head, and we would find out later, uh, planted a bag of marijuana on him. Uh, and basically, you know, gave him the routine. We'd, you have a long rap sheet, you know it, we know it, tell us where we can find a significant quantity of drugs, and we're going to arrest you again. 
Uh, so he just made up an address, basically, on the spot, and it happened to be Katherine Johnson's address. Uh, now, what's supposed to happen, of course, is the police are supposed to get a confidential informant uh, to do a controlled drug buy from the house. So, you know, they put a wire on him, give him some marked bills, uh, and that's where they get the probable cause then to go get a search warrant uh, and do their raid. The problem was that he had described basically what, what they later called a career-making drug bust, uh, and they didn't want to risk having the drug supply being moved before they could get there. Uh, so they lied. Uh, they made up a, a, an informant. They uh, fabricated a drug buy, and a process that was supposed to take a few days took a few hours. Uh, and so later that afternoon, they raided Katherine Johnson's home. Katherine Johnson woke up uh, to the sound of people breaking into her house. Uh, it took them a few minutes to get the bars off her door. Uh, when they did, she was standing in the living room, uh, pointing the old rusty revolver she kept next to her bed at the, at the door. Uh, the police opened fire uh, and killed her. Uh, they initially said that she shot at them first. We later found out that wasn't true. The, the gun she had wasn't functional. Um, two officers were wounded by bullets followed, fired by their fellow officers. Uh, they called for two ambulances for those officers. They did not call an ambulance for Katherine Johnston. Uh, instead, they handcuffed her and left her to bleed to death on her living room floor while one of them went to her basement uh, to plant a supply of drugs that they claimed they were going to find. Now, at this point, they realize they have to cover their tracks, right? So they have to find an informant who's going to claim to be the informant in the search warrant affidavit. Uh, so they go to this guy they've used in the past, and you know, drug informants are fairly shady characters. They tend to be addicts or uh, people who are trying to get their own charges reduced or dismissed. Uh, and to this guy's credit, uh, he refused to play along. Uh, there's an amazing uh, 911 call, you can still find the audio for online, uh, where he calls 911 from the back of an Atlanta squad car. And the 911 operator answers the phone and or answers the call, and he says, "Give me the FBI." Um, just sort of charmingly naive, uh, and he says, uh, "You know, they're they're trying to make me say I helped kill that old lady, and I don't I don't want any part of that." Uh, one of the officers apparently overhears this. Uh, he's in the car alone when he makes the call. Uh, he freaks out, jumps out of the car, starts running. They start chasing him, and now there's this surreal sort of foot chase going on in downtown Atlanta. Uh, ends up going through a couple businesses. He um, uh, ends up losing them long enough to get to a phone. He was also working with the ATF at the time as an informant. So he calls his ATF handler, who then sort of swoops in and picks him up, uh, drives him out to the suburbs, puts him up in a hotel, uh, and now we have a federal investigation. And what the federal investigation found uh, was that this was rampant in Atlanta, that the lying on the search warrants, uh, the uh, fabrication of uh, drug buys, the cover-ups, uh, this was going on, the wrong door raids. Uh, this was happening uh, way, way too often in Atlanta. And the reason why it was happening is because Atlanta narcotics officers had quotas they had to meet. Uh, each month they had to arrest so many people on drug charges, they had to confiscate a minimum supply of illicit drugs. Uh, and their performance reviews, their promotions, their raises were based on them meeting and exceeding these quotas. Uh, the Atlanta City Council held hearings where uh, about a dozen more people came forward and said that they too had been wrongly raided by a narcotics team. Uh, you know, the city made a lot of promises, a lot of uh, local politicians got really angry. Um, in the end, not much happened at all. Uh, they created a new, a new civilian review board, but within about three years, the police union had sued to basically render it impotent. Um, they took away its subpoena power, uh, they took away its uh, ability to um, the, initially, they wanted the Civilian Review Board's recommendations to be um, permanent, binding, yeah, and, and uh, after the police union was done, it was, uh, they were rec merely recommendations, uh, optional. Um, so basically, within a few years, things were back to normal uh, in Atlanta, even after all of this. Um, what the federal investigation didn't conclude, but which I'm going to conclude now, uh, is that what was driving these quotas in the first place, uh, and that's the... The reason for those quotas is because we have a number of federal programs that make money available to police departments across the country solely for the purpose of drug policing. Uh, so if you send your SWAT team out to arrest a suspected murderer or rapist, uh, there's no money involved in that. Uh, if you send your SWAT team out to arrest a low-level drug offender, uh, that helps you in your application for this limited pool of federal anti-drug money. So every police department in the country is competing with one another for these anti-drug grants. Um, so now you could argue that, you know, Atlanta is the only police department in the country where this is going on, and it just happened to be the only police department that got caught. Uh, I, would, I would say that that's fairly naive. Um, I, I would guess that the incentives that are in place in Atlanta uh, are incentives that are in place uh, 
you know, for the entire country, and I think we're going to see this, you know, that this is going on elsewhere. Um, did you have a question back there? Oh, okay. All right. I thought you were disagreeing with something I was saying, or, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so that, that's how, you know, we're sort of going to start the talk. So this, um, this is a quote that is commonly attributed once to Churchill, although I haven't been able to find any proof that he said it. Uh, but this is, I think, it was, it was a, it's a Cold War sentiment, uh, and I think it was, it was a way that we sort of distinguished ourselves during the Cold War from, you know, East Germany, uh, that, you know, in the United States, the government doesn't send men in black uh, to your, do armed men in black to your door in the middle of the night to enforce, you know, basically political crimes. Uh, and I would argue that we've not only gotten pretty far away from that sentiment, uh, you know, with the prol pr proliferation of the no-knock raid, uh, even the knocking part of that quote has become uh, optional. Um, but I do think it, it kind of represents sort of, or it's a good sort of um, uh, marker of sort of where we've come from, uh, this idea that we don't do that in this country, and we obviously do. Um, a lot of you probably heard of this phrase, posse comitatus. Uh, it's kind of misunderstood, uh, and this is something I learned when I was researching the book. Uh, posse comitatus does actually not, it does not forbid the president or the Congress from using the military for domestic law enforcement. That's commonly how it's, how it's used. Uh, actually, what it does is it prevents federal marshals or local officials from enlisting the military for domestic law enforcement purposes. But the president or the Congress can actually, um, tomorrow, could say, we're going to start using the Army to enforce the drug laws. In fact, during the Reagan administration, they tried to do that. Um, so posse comitatus is a little bit misunderstood. But, I w but the, the general kind of sentiment behind it and the fact that it is misunderstood in that way, I think, illustrates that we do have a tradition in this country, uh, as Matt talked about in his, in his introduction, of keeping the military very separate from domestic policing. And there are lots of good reasons for that. Um, but the most obvious one is that they're just two completely different institutions, right? The military's job uh, is to annihilate a foreign enemy, right? There's, their job is to kill people and break things. Um, a police officer's job is to protect our rights and to keep the peace. And these are two very, very different functions. Yeah, peace officers is what they're Or used to be called, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, these are two very different functions. And the fact that politicians tend to think that, that, they're, that they're interchangeable because they both carry guns and use force, uh, I think illustrates just how <laughs> clueless a lot of politicians are. Um, you know, the, the Troops to Cops program is a great example that the Clinton administration passed. And it was this idea that we should encourage police departments to hire, you know, troops returning from overseas. And, you know, in general, sort of in theory, that's a good idea. And in fact, um, uh, you know, troops former troops actually can make good cops. Um, but the sentiment behind it was that the jobs are sort of, you know, they both carry guns, so that's naturally that's a perfect job for a returning soldier is to become a police officer. Um, ironically, uh, the police chiefs I interviewed with the book say that um, returning soldiers actually make uh, better police officers because they do have some sense of discipline and sort of structure uh, and accountability that police officers today lack. Uh, which is basically saying that I think police today have in some ways become more militarized than the actual military. Um, so as I mentioned, during the 1980s, uh, there was a move to bring the military in to do domestic policing for the drug war. Uh, both Ronald Reagan and uh, members of leaders of both parties wanted active duty troops. Basically, they wanted Marines doing drug raids, arresting people, conducting searches. Uh, they wanted to bring the military and do this. And they actually, I mean, they succeeded in bringing the National Guard in. Uh, during the 80s, and actually until today, it started in the 80s, but you literally have black helicopters from the National Guard flying over rural areas of the country looking for pot plants and then, you know, sending soldiers, troops down, uh, rappelling down to, to cut, up, cut, the, cut up the pot uh, harvests. Um, but in the 80s, they, they really want, they wanted to bring in the military to actually do the policing part, the raids, the, raids, the arrests, and so forth. Um, and I think this is a sign of a healthy democracy that the institution that really kind of shot this idea down was the military itself. Uh, and this, was, this is a quote from uh, Major, Marine Major General Thomas Olstead, who I think was like the number three or four guy at the Pentagon at the time. Uh, and he was brought forth. And basically, uh, I think a lot of members of both parties were sort of surprised. They thought the military was going to be really gung-ho about this idea. Uh, and Olstead really kind of set them back, uh, kind of put them in their place. I, I love this quote. Um, and actually, I think it was his testimony that persuaded them uh, that this was a really bad idea. Um, We've done a really good job in this country of, of kind of respecting that tradition of keeping uh, the military out of domestic law enforcement. There have been a few instances um, where I think we've, uh, you know, where we've allowed it to happen. Uh, probably not going to be a popular sentiment uh, 
where I, given where I am, but uh, reconstruction is probably the most uh, uh, obvious example, and I would argue that that was probably necessary at the time. But there were also lots of civil unrest, riots, uh, where the military was brought in temporarily to put them down, but then immediately sort of dispatched back to the military once the threat was uh, quelled. So we've done a good job of that. Um, what I argue in the book and what I'm going to argue tonight uh, is that where we've dropped the ball is in uh, allow. we've done a good job keeping soldiers from being cops. What we've done a poor job of and what we've actually encouraged uh, is for our cops to become more like soldiers. And, you know, from, when you, from the perspective of, of how cops interact with their communities, with the people they serve, how they approach their jobs, you know, if you take a police officer and you arm him like a soldier and you dress him like a soldier in these battle dress uniforms that police officers or police departments are using now, you train him in military tactics, you give him military gear like tanks and armored personnel carriers, and then you send him out on the street and you tell him he's fighting a war, whether it's a war on drugs or crime or terrorism, um, you know, of course that's going to have an effect on his mentality and the way he approaches his job and the way he sees the people that he's supposed to be serving. Um, I don't think this is a terribly controversial notion, although a lot of people seem to think it is. Uh, but, you know, I, I, when it comes to the consequences of, what are the consequences of having active duty soldiers do domestic policing, I don't think they're any different than if it's an actual soldier or if it's a police officer who you've basically given all the accoutrements of a soldier. One more thing, too, in a lot of the local places, police force, they deem investigations like operations, operations. Oh, yeah. That guy's a military Oh, absolutely. Operations, there's, um, and I mean, police Police have been sort of paramilitary in nature since they were started, right? I mean, they assume the uh, titles of military officers and ranks. Um, I'll tell you, there's a little anecdote in the book about a, a, poli a assistant police chief in San Diego, Norm Stamper, who tried to demilitarize the San Diego Police Department only in sort of titles. Like he wanted, instead of sergeant and lieutenant, he wanted, you know, manager or supervisor or um, which is you know, what they do in the UK and actually what a lot of federal law enforcement agencies do. And it was like he had, you know, suggested that they disarm. I mean, it was like the, the, the visceral response was overwhelming. Even the San Diego newspaper wrote an editorial sort of mocking him for it. Like, how dare you take our military titles away from us? Um, so we're going to play a little game now. This is called Copper Soldier. Um, and this is just sort of to illustrate how difficult it has become to tell the difference. So I'm going to show you a photo, uh, and you're going to tell me if it's a cop or a soldier. Um, I will say that all these photos are either of U.S. military personnel or of police officers in the United States. Um, I didn't cheat by, you know, taking photos from other countries. So here we go. That's a cop. Soldier. Cop. Soldiers. Nope, those are cops. Everybody gets that one wrong. Cops are better dressed. Cops. Cops. Soldiers. Cops. 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 It's an Oregon State Trooper. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 oddly enough, the way to tell them apart is usually the soldiers are in much better shape, shape, uh, it's, um, I gotta be, be careful what I say here. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of history now about sort of how we got here. Um, this is a cop, by the way. Um, uh, there are two trends that kind of got us to the point where we are right now, and they both started at about the same time. <clears throat> It's the rise of the SWAT team and the rise of the drug war. I'll talk about the SWAT teams first. So this is Daryl Gates, as many of you probably know, a uh, longtime LAPD police chief. Um, Gates basically invented the idea of the SWAT team, uh, and it was a response to, he was basically in charge of LAPD's response to the Watts riots in 1965. And the Watts riots were really unlike anything, any riots we had ever seen in this country before. Um, there was, they weren't isolated to one part of the city. They sort of flared up and, and spun out and all over the city. Uh, there was no kind of arc of activity where things got worse and then started to get better. It sort of went on and on and, and sort of up and down for days. Uh, and Gates, you know, he was out in the middle of it and he sort of thought it, it reminded him of a kind of urban guerrilla warfare. Um, the, you know, the, when, when firefighters would come to put out fires, the, riot, the rioters would shoot at the firefighters. Uh, you know, when paramedics came to rescue people, uh, they would shoot at the paramedics. Uh, and so Gates, you know, 
really thought that the LAPD did not have an adequate response to these kinds of emergency situations. And you know, this, is, of course, was a time in our country's history when it would have been reasonable to, to expect more of this kind of civil unrest in the years to come. Uh, so Gates got this idea, well, if this is an urban guerrilla warfare, we need a more military-like response. Uh, so he consulted with some Marines at Camp Pendleton uh, and came up with this idea of having this very elite police team of these highly trained uh, police officers, trained in military tactics, um, who would have specialties that they could sort of then dispatch uh, to whatever, whatever the, um, the, the, the emergency was. And the idea was that you would use this overwhelming force and violence uh, to immediately smother a violent situation, a situation where you had lives that were at immediate risk. So you'd have a, you know, you'd have a sniper, you'd have a guy who was good at anti-sniper strategies, you would have a crowd control guy, somebody who could breach doorways, um, and these would all be specially trained and, and you know, they would be sort of the elite of the elite at LAPD. Um, interestingly, he, fr he first brings this idea to Chief William Parker, and Parker just shoots him down flat out. Uh, and I, f I find this fascinating. Parker, his reason was he said that this, this came too close to breaching this historical line that we have between police and the military. Um, Gates continued with the idea sort of under, uh, 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 on his own uh, until uh, Parker died of an aneurysm a year later, and when the new police chief took over, Gates brings the idea to him, uh, and he gives him the green light, and so now we have our first SWAT team. Uh, it was originally, the, the SWAT moniker originally stood for Special Weapons Assault Teams. Uh, somebody at LAPD told Gates it probably wouldn't be a good idea to have assault in the actual name, uh, so they changed it to Special Weapons and Tactics, uh, and that's how we, we get the SWAT name. The first SWAT raid occurs in 1969. Uh, it's a, against a Black Panther holdout in Los Angeles, and uh, logistically it was kind of a disaster. Uh, in fact, they were lucky that the entire SWAT team wasn't killed uh, the way it was carried out. Uh, but the Black Panthers were a legitimate, dangerous, scary organization. Um, this wasn't, I, I think Fox News sort of wants us to believe that the Black Panthers are the threat, you know, threat to civilization today. Uh, this was a different Black Panther group than they actually did have a body, a body count to their name. And a lot of Americans were legitimately afraid of this group. And here was this kind of heroic police team that was sent in to apprehend these guys. Um, and, you know, there were a, a hundreds and hundreds of rounds of fire exchange in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, but it did end with no fatalities. Um, interestingly, uh, if you know anything about this issue, uh, it's kind of surprising it turned out this way. Uh, the Black Panthers who fired back at LAPD were charged with various charges, including attempted murder. Uh, and the jury acquitted them on all counts. Uh, basically, they bought the self-defense argument. And that was the defense. The Panthers' defense was that this raid occurred first thing in the morning. We had no idea who it was. We had no idea they were police. We were you know, basically just defending ourselves, uh, and it worked. Uh, I'll try using that defense today during a drug raid. Um, in fact, I'm going to talk about what happens when you try to use that defense. Um, the next big raid comes in 1973 against the Symbionese Liberation Army. Uh, the SLA was a domestic terrorist organization. I mean, that's all they were. Uh, they had kidnapped Patty Harris into the newspaper heiress, so the whole country was sort of following the story. It was the big tabloid crime story of the day. Uh, Patty Hearst had been allegedly brainwashed by the group. She was seen like helping them rob a bank at one point by, on a security camera. And so when LAPD and FBI said that they had cornered the SLA at this house in Los Angeles, uh, the national media was sort of ready to pounce. And you can actually still find video of reporters sort of ducking under cars as bullets are whizzing by uh, during the SLA shootout. Uh, again, it was a logistical disaster. The house ended up burning down and killing everyone inside, including a lot of children. Um, but again, there was this heroic SWAT team that was confronting this legitimately dangerous terrorist organization. And this time it was nationally televised. And this really sort of injected SWAT into the pop culture and made it kind of a phenomenon. Um, two years later, Aaron Spelling produced a, a, a SWAT uh, TV drama, uh, which became the most popular show in the country. The, the theme song went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Um, a friend of mine thought it would be funny one time to, actually my ex-girlfriend, to make that my cell phone theme song without telling you. <laughs> but you get Milton Bradley comes out with the SWAT board game. Uh, you get SWAT lunch boxes and Viewmaster sets and jigsaw puzzles. Uh, and little, uh, yeah, and little, you know, die-cast SWAT mobiles that your son can use to raid his, you know, sister's dollhouse. Um, uh, I, 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 right. uh, I, I, by the way, I highly recommend the TV show from the 70s. If you like the kind of fast-talking, cheesy sort of cop melodramas from the 60s and 70s, it's wonderful. It's really, it's great. Uh, Hondo Harrelson is the name of the SWAT uh, commander, which is like the most testosterone-infused name I can possibly think of. Um, 
So by in 1970, there's one SWAT team. By 1975, there are 500. Uh, basically, every significant city in the country has a SWAT team by the mid-70s. But uh, they're mostly used, again, for these emergency-type situations uh, where, you, again, you're using violence to defuse an already violent scenario. Um, so the other thing, as I mentioned, that's happening during over this period is the rise of the drug war. Um, Nixon, you know, this 1968 campaign was all about crime. Um, if you want to be cynical about it, it was about exploiting fears of crime. If you're a Nixon person, it was about addressing the crime that was gripping our nation. Um, but one of the ideas he came up with, and this is a, sort of a nugget that I didn't realize until I started researching the book, um, the no-knock raid was something that sort of was born out of this campaign. It was actually Rockefeller had introduced it in New York, um, but it was the no-knock raid was not uh, a tactic that police chiefs were clamoring for. It wasn't something that criminologists were saying police had to have. Uh, it was actually the brainchild of a 28-year-old Senate staffer uh, who had been recruited to come up with ideas that Nixon could use in the campaign to sort of tap into fear of crime. Um, so the no-knock raid was something, it wasn't something that sort of organically came out of police work. I mean, I'm sure there were lots of cases where uh, you know, police got to a house and decided to go in without knocking first. The idea of sort of pre-applying for a no-knock warrant uh, was not, it was basically, it was a political ploy. It was a wedge issue that a, a Senate staffer had come up with. So in 1970, Nixon uh, gets two laws, gets Congress to pass two no-knock raid bills. One just applies to Washington, D.C. Uh, the other applies to uh, federal agents conducting drug investigations across the country. Um, two very different things, two, different, two very, very different responses to those two bills. In D.C., uh, the ch police chief at the time, a guy named Jerry Wilson, refused to implement it. He said D.C. didn't need it. Uh, he said it was violative of civil liberties. He said it was unnecessary. Um, I interviewed him for the book. He's actually still around, and he talked about, you know, the two excuses that you hear for the no-knock raid are that, um, you know, the police need to get in because if they announce themselves, the person inside will try to kill them. Uh, or because they'll try to dispose of evidence. Uh, and his response to both of those I thought w was fascinating. He said on the first one, he said, you know, drug dealers get into the drug game to make money. They don't get into the drug game to kill police officers. Uh, in fact, most drug dealers know that if you kill a cop, you're going to be lucky to survive the next four or five seconds. Um, you know, and if you do, you're going to prison for the rest of your life, and you're probably going to be executed if you're in a death penalty state. Um, as for the second point, he, he um, and this is a, a, a Point I've made on this issue many times, the destruction of evidence, if you think about what that does, the argument is if, if police can show a judge that if they knock and announce, the suspect will be able to destroy the drug evidence before they can get inside, basically by flushing it down the toilet. Now, if you think about how that sort of plays out in the real world, that actually gives more protection to a big-time drug dealer who has a huge supply of drugs in his house than it does the small-time dealer who has enough that he can quickly flush down the toilet. Um, so it actually gives more protection uh, to the big guys than to the small guys. Uh, yes? The flushing of the drugs, I mean, doesn't that do what they're doing? Get the drugs off the streets? Yeah. That's, that, was, uh, that was also Wilson's point. Um, and, you know, basically th that it's not about uh, destroying the evidence, it's about preserving the conviction. I mean, that's why they want to get in there quickly. And Wilson said flat out, he said, you know, I, don't see why, I didn't see why I should put my officers' lives at risk in order to preserve a drug conviction. Um, well, this is before asset forfeiture, though. Um, Interestingly, so D.C. refuses to implement the no-knock policy, and very interestingly, uh, crime actually goes down in D.C. over the next three years while it goes up in the rest of the country. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure that his refusal to implement the no-knock rate is not why crime went down in D.C., but it's interesting that it did. Um, at the federal level, things are very different. Uh, these undercover narcotics cops start kicking do down doors left and right, taking advantage of this law. They're raiding the wrong house. Um, they're raiding houses without warrants. Uh, people are getting killed. Uh, the, New York, the New York Times does an investigation, finds dozens of wrong door raids. AP does its own investigation, finds more. And this is another thing I, I was not expecting to find in researching the book. Uh, Congress actually showed some shame. Uh, they called hearings. Uh, they brought the victims of these raids forward to testify. And they repealed both no-knock raid laws. Not only that, they passed another law making the federal government liable, financially liable, for any damage done during a wrong door raid. Um, I was floored by that, that there was actually a time in our history when Congress was capable of admitting and made a mistake um, and, and could repeal these laws. Of course, the no-knock raid is going to come back in the 80s, and there's going to be a huge trail of collateral damage and death, uh, and I mean, you can't get anybody in Congress to, to listen to that, uh, to care about that at this point. Um, 
but there was a time when it did. So you have these two trends going on, and they're moving parallel to one another, right? These, the, these federal raids are being done by guys in street clothes, not, not SWAT teams. Um, at the same time, you've got the SWAT phenomenon taking off, but the SWAT teams are being reserved for these emergency type situations. So, you know, riots and active shooters and bank robberies and that sort of thing. Um, it isn't until the 80s and the Reagan administration that we see the two trends converge. Um, and now we see SWAT teams primarily used to serve warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Um, and there, this is a significant shift for a number of reasons. First, you know, when you're using SWAT teams to serve search warrants on, on people suspected of drug crimes, you're you're no longer using this kind of violence to defuse an already violent situation. You're actually creating violence and confrontation where there was none before. Second, um, you're not using this kind of force against somebody who is actually in the process of committing a violent crime. You're now using it against somebody who's merely suspected of committed, committing a nonviolent crime. Uh, you're basically, you're not using SWAT teams to save lives that are at immediate risk. You're using them as an investigative tool uh, to conduct searches of people's homes. Uh, and this is a dramatic shift in how this kind of force is used. Uh, but of course, you know, we were sort of in the middle of a drug war uh, hysteria at the time. Uh, there was a big, you know, dehumanization campaign that the Reagan administration also went uh, engaged in with, with the willing compliance of the media. Uh, you have people like William Bennett, who was Reagan's edu education secretary, later becomes our first official drug czar, uh, who at one point on Larry King floated the idea of publicly beheading drug dealers. Um, also said, and I'll use the scare quotes that he used, uh, it's a funny kind of war when the enemy is given habeas corpus. Uh, so already floating the idea of indefinite detention of people suspected of drug crimes. Um, Reagan himself uh, in 1986 declares illicit drugs a threat to US national security. Uh, he likened the drug war to the World War I battle of Verdun, uh, which if you know your European history was this long protracted battle with about three quarters of a million casualties over a strip of land that meant nothing to either side, and nobody ended up winning, which I think the metaphor was probably more apt than Reagan realized at the time. Um, you have Daryl Gates then, who became a leading sort of drug warrior uh, public advocate, who at one point said that drug users, not even drug dealers, that drug users uh, were guilty of treason and should be taken out in the street and shot. Uh, this is a position he walked back a little bit when his son was caught with drugs. <laughs> uh, twice, actually. Um, and there are lots of quotes like this in the book, but this is just one example of how this, this martial rhetoric, this war rhetoric, starts to filter down to local police chiefs, sheriffs, and individual officers. Um, you may have remember uh, a couple years ago, Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, referred to NYPD as the seventh largest army in the world. Um, I mean, this, this betrays a very fundamental misunderstanding of what the role of police officers are. This is the sheriff in Clayton County, Georgia. I love this quote. He says, I, you know, I liken it to the Vietnam War, referring to the drug war. Hit and miss, there's no clear win. We don't know if we're gaining ground or not. What we want to do, change our strategy. We want to make this more like a Normandy invasion. This is a police officer talking about his constituents, right? The people he's supposed to be serving. And not only is he saying, you know, we need to fight the drug war like a real war, we need to fight it like World War II, not some namby-pamby war like Vietnam. Um, and there, you see these you see these quotes all the time, where, where police chiefs and sheriffs and, and politicians refer to police officers as soldiers or troops. Uh, the mayor or the police chief in Milwaukee, um, at one point, um, basically said that he was instructing his police officers that they were to, if they saw anybody open carrying, openly carrying in, in Milwaukee, uh, they were to tackle the person, throw them to the ground, and point their guns at them, and then it would, and then they would determine whether or not the person was carrying legally. Um, and of course, Wisconsin state law, you're allowed to open carry. Um, but when he was asked about this, basically he said, uh, you know, my, the job, something to the effect of like, the job of my troops is to protect the public. Um, so, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be at all surprising that a guy who refers to his officers as troops uh, would also have no problem with tackling people and putting guns to their heads and then making them prove that they haven't broken the law. Um, so, Reagan does a couple of things that have stuck with us ever since. Uh, first, first thing he does is he instructs the Pentagon to start making surplus military equipment available to police departments across the country. Um, and he does this kind of informally. The policy then gets formalized by Congress in 1997 uh, with an office and a budget. But basically, you know, now you have the Pentagon starting to give uh, tanks, armored personnel carriers, machine guns, helicopters, bayonets for some weird reason. Police departments love bayonets. Uh, to police departments across the country. And this is equipment that's designed uh, for use on a battlefield that's being given to domestic police departments for use on American streets and in American neighborhoods. Um, the other thing Reagan does is he, he starts creating these anti-drug grants. Uh, 
which are these you know federal this federal money solely for the purpose of drug policing. So if you think about this, you're a sheriff or a police chief, right? And you got all this cool gear you just got from the Pentagon, so you start a SWAT team because you know why not? Um, and you know you're waiting for some bank robbery or active shooter situation to come to your town, and it never does. Now you can either keep your SWAT team in mothballs and wait for one of those emergency type situations. Or you can start sending your SWAT team out on drug raids, which uh, will bring in federal money and actually generate revenue for your police department. So what we see is an explosion both in the number and use of SWAT teams across the country. Um, and there's a, a criminologist at Eastern Kentucky, Peter Kraska, who in 1999 sent surveys out to police departments across the country and asked them to go back and tell them when they started their SWAT team and then how many times they had used it each year and what they used it for. And what he found was, in the late 70s, there were about 300 SWAT deployments per year across the entire country. By the early 80s, we were up to about 3,000, and by 2005, when he did his follow-up study, we were looking at 50,000 SWAT deployments per year in the United States. Um, that was 2005. Uh, he hasn't done a survey since, but you know the trend. If you look at his trend line, uh, you know the policies that were driving the trend line haven't changed. In fact, they've only strengthened uh, uh, under the current administration. So he estimates we're somewhere between 80 and 100,000 SWAT raids per year in the U.S. now. About 75 to 80 percent of them, um, he found, were, were to serve search warrants on people suspected of drug crimes. Uh, although I think that, that number is probably a little lower for reasons I'll get into later. Um, another statistic he found that I, I still find pretty mind-blowing. Uh, in 1980, if you look at towns between 25,000 and 50,000 people, so fairly small towns, uh, in 1980 about 13 percent of them had a SWAT team. Uh, by 2000, 80 percent of them did, uh, and it's probably safe to assume that just about all of them do now. Uh, my hometown, Greenfield, Indiana, has 14,000 people. Uh, they have two SWAT teams that serve Greenfield, Indiana. Um, and by the way, this Pentagon, this giveaway program, I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, you don't have to just, you don't have to demonstrate any need for this equipment. In fact, uh, Boone County, Indiana, which is completely landlocked, got an amphibious armored personnel carrier through the Pentagon program. Um, there's a sheriff in Florida that 60 Minutes profiled a few years ago who basically assembled his own Air Force uh, through this program. Um, I mean, there's no, it's basically, you don't, the police department themselves, they only have to pay for shipping or they only have to get it there. Uh, I know the LA County Sheriff's Office in California actually has two 18-wheelers on standby just to send out to pick up this gear when it becomes available on the website. Uh, there's like a website where you can, you know, yeah, as the, as the equipment becomes available. Um, and I've, I mean, you, you could write just ludicrous profiles of police departments across the country of the, the you know, the crap they're getting through this program. Um, uh, I wrote one, there's a tiny town in Rhode Island that, you know, got, I think they got like seven Humvees through the program and, you know, a bunch of uh, M16s and weirdly like eight snowblowers. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's all just sort of how good you are at manipulating the program. There's no, uh, you don't have to demonstrate any sort of need. Um, just a quick couple anecdotes. This is Sheriff Leon Lott in Richland County, South Carolina, uh, and this is his tank. Um, he got this uh, through the Pentagon program. As you can see, it has a 360-degree rotating gun turret that shoots, uh, it's a machine gun that shoots 50 caliber ammunition. Uh, now, the military has restrictions on 50 caliber ammunition. Uh, it'll go through eight or ten city blocks no matter what's standing in the way. Completely inappropriate for domestic policing. Uh, you know, there's no reason you need a 50 caliber machine gun in domestic policing. Um, well, yeah, that's right, in case there's a coup. Um, when Sheriff Lott got his tank, he put out a press release with this photo at the top of it. Uh, he named his tank the Peacemaker. Uh, and at the top of the press release included the Bible verse, uh, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. <laughs> to give you an idea of what kinds of situations Sheriff Lott thinks this sort of force is appropriate, you might remember a few years ago, uh, the Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps was uh, photographed smoking pot at a party at the University of South Carolina. This was Sheriff Lott's jurisdiction. He was personally offended by that photo, uh, and it caused him a lot of personal embarrassment. So he decided he was going to get to the bottom of whoever supplied the pot that was being smoked in that photo. And I, I'm not kidding you, there's actually a lawsuit against Sheriff Lott right now alleging that, and of course this is half of the lawsuit, so keep that in mind, that he had sent his SWAT team to raid everyone who appears in that photo. Um, so it's a, these surreal descriptions where basically they say, you know, my client was woken up in the middle of the night to a flash grenade, armed men breaking into his home, you know, uh, roused him from sleep, put a gun to his head, and screamed, not where the drugs, where are the guns, but what do you know about Michael Phelps? Um, 
which is amusing and sort of terrifying at the same time, I think. Um, these are just more photos of tanks and other fun gear. Uh, Joe Arpaio, the self-proclaimed toughest sheriff in America. This is that's his tank that he got through the Pentagon program. Yeah, that's that's his that's his tank. Um, um, and this is you might Steven Seagal right here, the uh, action movie star. So Steven Seagal is, uh, was deputized by a sheriff's department in Louisiana a few years ago for a reality show. Uh, he ended up getting having to resign after some unfortunate um, sexual harassment allegations. Uh, but he was he was later he was later deputized by Arpaio, uh, and the, so the show starts again. And to demonstrate, I guess you know how tough he is, Arpaio sent uh, Steven Seagal to drive this tank, uh, Arpaio's tank, uh, into this poor guy's living room. Uh, the guy was suspected of cockfighting, so raising chickens to fight one another. Uh, and for that, they drove a tank into his living room. They uh, ended up euthanizing the chickens and killing the guy's two dogs. When Seagal was asked why, why you drove, a, why did you drive a tank into a guy's living room when he was suspected of cockfighting, uh, Seagal responded that he's an animal lover. So that's why that sort of force was necessary. Um, I never the camouflage always gets me too. I mean, there's no, there's no plausible reason for domestic police officers to wear a camouflage. I mean, one. When you're conducting a raid, you're not hiding. You're making yourself very known. Second, even if you were, you're not raiding forests, right? You're raiding you're actual raiding houses. And I mean, the only the only reason to wear camouflage is one to mimic the military, or two, you're getting the stuff directly from the military, and it's, it's actually usually the second. But it does. It, there's a you know there's a psychological component to this. I mean, when you dress up like a soldier, you're going to start thinking more like a soldier, or acting like, or seeing yourself as a soldier. Um, the face masks are interesting. There's a conservative commentator, Michael Ledeen, who um, few years ago was agitating for war with Iraq, uh, and he wrote on the, the website uh, Pajamas, uh, uh, Peach, uh, Pajamas Media, the sort of conservative blog network. Um, there were a, a series of um, photos that had come out of Tehran from Reuters that showed a, a, a raid, drug raid in Tehran, a cocaine raid by Iranian police, and they're all wearing face masks during the raid. And I remember being amusing because I've, I've you know, I'd been writing about this issue for a while by then, but I remember being amused by Ledeen because he wrote this blog post about how you know you living in, you're living in a totalitarian country when law enforcement officers cover their faces while they're conducting police operations. And of course, I'd known that I mean, this happens all the time in the United States. Uh, so apparently, I don't know, we should invade the US. Uh, this is a SWAT team at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Now, uh, this is the other thing we're seeing are campus SWAT teams now. Um, Ohio State now has one. I would be surprised. I would not actually. I think the University of Alabama does have one because I think they did a, a series of drug raids a couple of years ago. Um, but the, the justification is always, you know, uh, Columbine, Virginia Tech. We have to be prepared. Uh, there's a sociologist at Virginia who studies school violence. Who's actually crunched the numbers, and he found his name's Dewey Cornell. He found that um, the average middle school, high school, or college campus can expect to see a homicide about once every six thousand years. Um, so the idea that every campus needs a SWAT team to prevent another Virginia Tech is just absurd. The problem, though, is that when, once you have the SWAT team, uh, you want to use it. And there's plenty of, you know, generally plenty of pot smokers on a campus to keep the SWAT team busy. Yeah. 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 The police did, yeah. Um, I wrote a... I wrote a white paper for the Cato Institute a while back on this issue, and we, we put together a couple of maps to go with it. These are Google Maps. You can go and click on each of these thumbtacks, and it'll tell you sort of the history and sources about what happened. But each of these red marks actually is a case where a completely innocent person was killed in one of these raids. So this is where they found no drugs. They got the wrong house. Um, in some cases, actually, there, was, there were drugs, but you know, there's a child that was caught in the crossfire um, or just outright shot by police. Uh, but there are about, I, I think there are about 52 of these that I've found now where somebody completely innocent was killed during one of these raids. Yes? Did all of those end up as lost Oh, no. I mean, very few of them did. Um, most of the time, uh, because police have qualified immunity, um, it's difficult to even get to court. Um, and you, mere negligence usually isn't enough. You have to show some sort of malice. Uh, so basically, if a police officer makes a mistake and shoots someone during one of these raids, you know, Basically, they'll get the benefit of the doubt because it's a very volatile situation and you know, there's a very thin margin for error. Now, of course, the police created that situation and the police on the or people on the receiving end of those raids aren't given that same sort of consideration. Um, but most of the time, I mean, almost never, usually if you can generate a lot of media attention, a lot of outrage, 
Um, a city will settle just sort of out of shame or to sort of, you know, make the story go away. But it's really, really difficult to win one of these cases in court. Catherine Johnson's family won a lot of money, but that's because they showed that the police, you know, actually tried to frame her after the fact. But if it's just a mistake, you know, they get the wrong house, somebody wrote the wrong address down, um, you, I mean, you're not going to win in court. You're probably not even going to get to court, actually. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about another kind of, um, I think, kind of, Significant moment in the story comes in 1996 when California legalizes medical marijuana. Um, up until that point, the justification for using this kind of force had been, you know, drug dealers are very dangerous people. They, you know, they won't think twice before killing a police officer. They're armed like, you know, third world armies. Um, and there are rebuttals to all those arguments, but at least the government was making those arguments, right? They're saying, we need to use this kind of force because of the threat that we're facing. Um, when California legalizes medical marijuana, and, you know, lots of states have since followed suit, uh, the Clinton administration responded by sending federal SWAT teams in to raid these clinics and dispensaries and marijuana groups. Now, these were all, at this point, these are all businesses. They're openly operating. They have business licenses. Uh, these aren't underground criminal enterprises. Uh, you know, the hippie mom and pop couple that are, that's running the pot shop aren't a threat to pull a gun out from under the counter and kill a bunch of federal agents, right? Um, so at this point, uh, the government is basically, you know, uh, openly and without reservation, using violence to send a political message, to make a political statement. And that statement is, you're openly flouting federal law, so we're going to bring the boot down on you. But, you know, I don't think people are really, I mean, a lot of people protested the raids at the time and have since, uh, but I don't think people really realize just how significant, uh, what the, just what kind of significance these raids represented. I mean, you know, this is not the sort of thing we normally associate with a free society, right? We, we give the government permission to use force and violence to protect us from violent people, from foreign enemies. But the idea of using violence to make a political statement, um, that's not something that, you know, I would argue that's not something that's consistent with the principles of a free or democratic society. And this is, there's no question that this is what the government was doing. I mean, there was no reason to send SWAT teams into these, you know, uh, cancer convalescent centers where people were smoking pot. I mean, there's absolutely no reason for it other than to, to make an example of it. And of course, we're seeing this continuing today. Uh, there have actually been more uh, pot raids uh, in states where it's legal by the Obama administration in four years than there were under Bush in eight. Um, and in fact, you're also seeing things like, you may have read, there have been uh, federal raids on uh, Amish farms and uh, co-ops that are selling unpasteurized milk products to people who want to buy unpasteurized milk products. Uh, but again, they're openly flouting FDA regulations. Some, some of them have been warned several times. Uh, so you have to send in uh, the SWAT team to basically make an example of these people. Uh, Gibson wasn't really a SWAT raid. Uh, it was, I think it was misreported in a lot of places as a SWAT raid. But it was, it was an armed raid by the Department of the Interior. Um, I, th I would argue it was heavy handed, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a sort of commando sort of raid. Uh, but you know, the Department of Education has a SWAT team. Um, Actually, let me back that up a little bit. I actually wrote an essay for the Wall Street Journal about the Department of Education SWAT team. And the Department of Education demanded a correction uh, from the Wall Street Journal editors, which uh, to my dismay, they granted them. But the part they, what they said is, yes, we have a team of, law, of armed law enforcement officials who serve high-risk search warrants with uh, you know, battering rams and shotguns, but we don't call it a SWAT team. Therefore, we demand a correction. And the reason they said they don't call it a SWAT team is because they don't get tactical training. So this is their defense. Their defense is we have this team that does everything a SWAT team does, but they're less well trained. Therefore, we're offended that you would call them a SWAT team. Um, and I was really, I was disappointed that the Wall Street Journal ran the correction and didn't point out the absurdity of that argument. Uh, I'm good. For now. Um, so I want to talk about the, the, the next kind of significant moment in the story. Uh, this has happened in the last five or six years where we're now seeing mission creep from these SWAT teams where they're moving beyond the drug war to the point where they're enforcing regulatory law, uh, they're doing raids on you know, neighborhood poker games. Uh, this is in Orlando. The police suspected there was drug activity going on in a lot of these barber shops across the, the city, um, but they actually could not get enough evidence to get a search warrant, uh, which of course means they had no evidence at all. So what they did is they called somebody up from the state's occupational licensing board uh, who accompanied the SWAT teams on these raids. And now this is no longer a police action. It was a regulatory inspection to make sure all the barbers were properly licensed to cut hair. Uh, they were just enforcing it with the SWAT team. Uh, they arrested 37 people 
Uh, 34 of them were arrested for barbering without a license, uh, which only one person had ever been arrested before in the state of Florida for. Uh, they found two guys that had some drugs on them that, that got misdemeanor charges. They had found one guy uh, who had enough for a felony charge. Um, I wrote about a case in uh, Virginia where there was a big SWAT raid on a pool hall there. Again, this was a, a criminal investigation that they didn't have enough evidence for a search warrant. So they called up the Alcohol Beverage Control Board, and this was now officially a liquor inspection. They were making sure that all the bottles were properly labeled uh, and so forth. But they sent a 50-member SWAT team uh, with shotguns and face masks and camouflage to conduct this alcohol inspection. And here's where I think it gets particularly scary. The owner of that bar sued in federal court. And the Federal Court of Appeals, uh, which includes Virginia, somebody just told me this at lunch and I forgot already whatever district that is, um, but that Federal Appeals Court actually ruled that uh, sending a SWAT team to enforce alcohol regulations is not unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, now, to be fair, the district we're in now, the appeals court has actually said that that is an unreasonable uh, use of force under the Fourth Amendment. But the fact that there is a split in the federal appeals courts over whether it's reasonable to use a SWAT team to enforce regulatory law, uh, to me, is just astonishing. Um, and we're seeing this over and again. There have been SWAT raids on fraternities and bars where police suspect there's underage drinking going on. Uh, there was just a SWAT raid in uh, Texas on that was basically a zoning enforcement. This woman had. Uh, was fighting with the city about uh, mowing her grass, and she had like some you know couches out on her in, in her yard, uh, and she wouldn't clean it up. So they basically sent the SWAT team in uh, to force her to clean it up. Um, in St. Louis County, this is just a few weeks ago. Uh, there was a SWAT raid for a, a, a um, white collar crime of some kind, uh, and it was a, a, a search warrant that they were serving for a non criminal, basically a non violent crime. It was a um, some sort of business fraud. Uh, but they sent the SWAT team, and the local media asked the, the St. Louis County Police Department, why did you send the SWAT team for this? And the spokesman for the police department actually said, in St. Louis County now, every search warrant is served as a SWAT team, regardless of the crime. So this use of force that was once reserved for riots, for bank robberies, for hostage takings, uh, is now, in, in, in it's not just St. Louis County, but in many jurisdictions across the country, now the default use of force anytime police need to serve uh, a search warrant. Um, NASA has its own SWAT team that this poor woman who um, her husband I guess her, her husband got like a piece of dust from Neil Armstrong I guess they were friends and her husband died so she tried to sell this piece of moon dust on eBay which is, I guess is a violation of federal law so NASA sent a SWAT team to the local Denny's to arrest her as she was eating breakfast uh, this is the Department of Education case uh, in Utah there's a strike force, a SWAT team, basically just to enforce copyright law, which again is a civil violation, not a criminal violation. Uh, this is poker stuff. Uh, this is Sal Colosi. Uh, Sal was a 38-year-old optometrist in uh, uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. He was at a TGI Fridays with some friends when the Virginia-Virginia Tech game was on. They were wagering on the game. Uh, there also happened to be an undercover police officer with the vice unit of the Fairfax County Police Department there who overheard this. Uh, he befriended Colosi, started wagering with him, uh, prodded Colosi to wager increasingly large amounts of money until they wager $2,000 on a single game, which is enough to trigger the state statute for running a gambling operation. They had no evidence that Colosi was a bookie. Basically, the only evidence was this bet that he had made with this undercover yeah, cop. I mean, well, there's that too, yeah. Um, so whatever you think about that particular investigation, I, I can think of some words to describe it. Um, you know. They could have just sent a couple of uniformed cops to Colosi's house to arrest him. Instead, they decide to send the SWAT team. So Colosi comes out on the porch to meet this guy who he thought was a friend to give him his winnings. The SWAT team pounces. Um, one of the officers, uh, for whatever reason, fires his gun, hits Colosi right square in the heart, and kills him. Um, the police account was that the officer had gotten out of the SUV, the door recoiled, hit his elbow, which caused him to mistakenly fire the gun, which scored a direct hit to Colosi's heart. His family thinks uh, Colosi was reaching into his pocket for a cell phone, which the cop mistook for a gun. That seems like the more plausible explanation to me. But in any case, you know, why are you sending a SWAT team after this guy who was gambling on football? Um, this was in January 2006. Two months later, of course, it's the NCAA tournament. The uh, Fairfax County Police Department puts out a press release. Uh, and I don't think they did this intentionally. I think it was just a case of them being tone deaf. But, I mean, this is a big, big story in Virginia at the time. But I'm personally saying, um, uh, don't, basically saying, the headline was something to the effect of don't enter your office's NCAA tournament pool 
uh, you can't handle the risk. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right after they had basically executed a guy for gambling on college football games. Um, so child porn is the, the next thing we're seeing SWAT teams used. And again, this goes back to sending a message. Obviously, child, people who, who view child pornography uh, aren't particularly sympathetic, so we're going to throw everything we have at them. Uh, the problem is most child porn now is done over the internet, uh, and you can't trace a IP address to a physical address with any real reliability. I mean, you, you can, but it's, it's easy to make mistakes. The other problem is a lot of people have open wireless connections that they don't password protect. So there have been lots of cases like this one where police uh, have raided, sent the SWAT team to raid someone because their neighbor was using their open wireless connection to look at child porn. Um, so this is a case where they did this, and of course you can read the description. The guy is obviously terrorized by the SWAT team. Uh, they realize they have the wrong house. Now, what do you think the lesson is that the police and the media drew from this case? Maybe we shouldn't use SWAT teams for nonviolent crimes like this. Maybe we should make sure we have the right house before we send the SWAT team. Make sure you password protect your wireless connection. It was his fault that this happened to him. Um, this is the, a the AP's headline on that story. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories. This is in rural Virginia. Uh, this is a farmer uh, who is uh, basically, you know, getting out of his truck, um, and the SWAT team pounces. This is another child porn investigation. They trace the IP address to the wrong physical address. Now, think about this. Like, you're a guy, you know, you're a farmer in Virginia. You're coming home from a long day. You're getting out of your truck. All of a sudden, the SWAT team pounces. They put a gun to your head. You look up, and there is Shaquille O'Neal. So Shaquille O'Neal is another sort of celebrity who's an aspiring law enforcement officer. He's been deputized at police departments across the country, including this one in rural Virginia. Um, and so they decided to take him along on the SWAT raid, uh, and they ended up getting the wrong house, and this guy gets basically swatted by <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, I can't I mean, it had to be some sort of dream sequence then. It's, uh, and this is Shaq's response afterward of why they got the wrong house. Uh, this was a story about some Tibetan monks who were in the U.S. on a peace mission and overstayed their visas, so naturally you send the SWAT team to apprehend them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this. So this is the next kind of chapter in this story. In 2000, obviously we have the September 11th attacks in 2001, and uh, we get DHS in 2003. So the Department of Homeland Security responds by sending out these, um, basically, checks to police departments across the country to buy new military-grade equipment. Now, the Pentagon program, the Pentagon surplus program I talked about, um, you know, that was equipment, that stuff already existed, right? It was sitting in a warehouse somewhere, it was surplus. This DHS program is going to buy new equipment. So this has given rise to a cottage industry of companies that have sprung up solely for the purpose of building this new equipment in exchange for these DHS checks. Now, this industry, I'm sure they've already done it. If they haven't, they will soon. They're going to open lobbying offices in D.C. to make sure these programs continue and expand the whole system's going to start feeding off of itself, and now you have uh, the police industrial complex, right? The little brother of the military industrial complex, which is going to make it much more difficult to get roll any of this back. Um, I have another video I want to show you. The, um, the, the company that makes the Bearcat, which is the most popular armor personnel carrier that these police departments are buying with these grants, is called Lenco. And I wrote a story a while back about a town in New Hampshire that was actually fighting one of these Bearcats. Their town council wanted to purchase it. They got up in arms. They decided... We don't want this in our town. Um, I talked to a spokesman for Lenco, and he said that these armored personnel carriers were all about officer safety, and anybody who objects obviously doesn't care about the lives of police officers. Uh, but he also said something. He said, you know, when a bear cat shows up at a crime scene, it's more likely to be filled with psychiatrists than it is with a SWAT team. Um, and basically he was saying that basically this is all about de-escalation, right, about talking people down, about conflict resolution. This wasn't about violence. Now I'm going to show you um, the video that Lenco sends, sends to police departments across the country to market the Bearcat to encourage them to get one of these DHS grants to buy it. Uh, and I'll let you decide for yourself whether this is about de-escalation. So uh, let's pull up the other video. So this is the video they sent out.
not sure what purpose that serves, but this is my favorite part. This is the, the unsubtle phallic imagery here is awesome. <laughs> Cracks me up every time. All right, we can. So that's unlike any psychiatrist I've ever seen. But yeah, I was gonna say I, I want one of those after watching that. Definitely. Um, yeah, that you can start right there. That's fine. So um, the other uh, narrative in the book, and I'll just cover this real quickly because we're I'm talking for a long time here. Um, but it's protest, and and uh, there's this is a. The same kind of problems that we're seeing in these other issues is, is also applied to protest. Um, when I interviewed Jerry Wilson, the former DC police chief, when he was during his tenure in DC, there were actually no protests that turned violent. And of course, this is in the early 70s, and there are lots of protests going on in DC. Um, and I think it was his approach. He basically said, you know, you have to have the riot squad on hand and nearby in case things get out of hand. But he said he, he put them on buses and he parked them on side streets so they're out of view. And he would personally show up at protests, and his, he would bring his, his officers in uniform in their police blues uniforms, uh, you know, to 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 basically you know hold the lines against the protesters. But he said something that I thought was pretty profound. He said, you know, if you send cops into a protest expecting violence and confrontation, that's what you're going to get. Um, and after the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999, and the way the Seattle Police Department responded with cops in sort of the full RoboCop gear. Uh, and it did erupt into violence. That has become kind of the default response to protest in this country. Um, I interviewed Norm Stamper, the police chief in Seattle, who oversaw that response. And today he calls it the biggest mistake of his career. And he said he's absolutely heartbroken by it because he's seen how this has become, again, the default way that we respond to protest in this country is by, you know, sending the cops out in the full sort of body armor. Um, just to give you an example, I talk a, little, a lot in the book about the mindset problem and how, you know, all this is, has caused cops to see themselves as soldiers and to see you know, their, their job is basically more of a, a soldier's job than a peace officer's job. Um, this is a, uh, I'm gonna not spoil for you before I set it up. This is a t-shirt that the Denver Police Union printed up before the DNC convention in 2008 and was actually selling publicly, uh, not just to fellow officers, they were, this is a, basically a fundraiser um, before the DNC protests had started. So it says, you know, we get up early to beat the crowds. Um, actually, I wrote a, a piece for Huffington Post about this police t-shirt culture, but this is very common. There's a, a police union in California that printed up a bunch of t-shirts. Um, this, this is a school police union, so there are enough school police officers in California now that they have their own union. Um, and they printed up a shirt for a fundraiser that uh, showed a, an eight-year-old kid uh, in a, in a um, jail cell with bars in front of him. Uh, and it said, you know, something California school police union. And on the back it said, you raise them, we cage them. Um, I mean, this is, you know, it's one thing, you know, I, I understand people who have a, you know, morbid sense of humor because you have a rough job. It's one thing for cops to make these jokes over beers, to openly sort of advertise this, to make T-shirts that you sell to the public and wear in public. I mean, I think it really kind of betrays a, a, a significant problem with sort of the mindset that cops approach their jobs with today. Um, let me just, I want to talk about this case just because it's uh, sort of amusing before I get to the final anecdote. But uh, so this is a couple in Brooklyn uh, who were raided uh, more than 50 times uh, over a, I think it was about a four or five year period. Um, they kept going to the, uh, to the Brooklyn precinct to the NYPD and saying, what's going on, right? Why, why is it that every few weeks a bunch of cops break into our house and point their guns at us? Uh, and they couldn't get anyone in NYPD to pay attention to them. And it wasn't until they went to the media uh, that NYPD actually looked into what was going on. Uh, and basically, I guess what had happened is they installed some sort of new computer system. And when they were testing it out, someone put in a dummy address to test out the search warrant application on the new computer system. When they in, then implemented the system, they didn't take the dummy address out. So anytime an officer applied for a search warrant and forgot to take the dummy address out and put the real address in, this couple got raided. And, you know, I don't think this is happening all over the country, uh, but the fact that they couldn't get anyone in NYPD to pay attention to the fact that they were getting the hell scared out of them every few weeks, uh, and it wasn't until the media got a hold of this story that NYPD looked into it, I think is pretty telling. Um, the, the guy who lived there before them had also been raided several times. He had enough smarts to get the hell out. Um, 
but you know, you know, when a, a real estate agent shows you a house, they're supposed to tell you all the, the bad things about the house, right? They're obligated to. So I always sort of wondered if the agent told this couple, you know, uh, every couple weeks a bunch of cops are going to break in and throw you on the floor and point guns at you. But you know, you know, it's a three-car garage and marble countertops. You know, right? That uh, makes up for everything. Um, so I'm going to I'll close with the Corey May story here, um, and I think I, I close with the story because I think it really kind of poignantly illustrates. Uh, really just how far we've come in this issue and how comfortable we've become with these kinds of tactics. So Corey May was a 21-year-old uh, uh, guy when all this happened. Uh, he and his girlfriend had just moved in, moved in together uh, with their 18-month-old daughter, you see her in the picture, uh, in a duplex on Mary Street uh, in Prentice, Mississippi. Uh, earlier, th uh, this is the day after Christmas 2001 when all this happened. Uh, earlier that day, a, a drug informant named Randy Gentry had uh, called up, up Ron Jones, the officer he worked with regularly, and said that there was drug activity going on at, uh, in the duplex on Mary Street. Uh, allegedly, uh, Gentry then did a controlled buy from the house. Uh, Gentry, by the way, a little side note, was described in all these search warrants as trustworthy and reliable. It's just kind of the catchphrase that they use in all these warrants when they're talking about informants. Uh, my, I later discovered who Gentry was uh, when Corey's uh, lawyers contacted him, uh, he left a message on one of their machines. Uh, it's about, I think, if I remember right, it's about 70 seconds long, and I think he manages to work the end bomb in about 15 or 16 times in that 70 seconds. Um, he's a drug addict himself. This is the guy who was described over and over again as trustworthy and reliable. Um, Jones assembles a raid team. Uh, Corey and his girlfriend lived on one side of the duplex, as I said. On the other side was a guy named Jamie Smith, uh, who already had drug charges pending against him, was a known drug dealer in the area. Uh, for whatever reason, they decided to raid both sides of the duplex. Uh, neither Corey nor his girlfriend's name appears anywhere on the search warrant. Uh, there is a separate warrant for his side of the duplex. It doesn't appear there was any probable cause for that warrant. Uh, but they raided both sides of the duplex. Uh, Jamie Smith wakes up. This is 1230 in the morning. Jamie Smith wakes up to pe people breaking into his house. He's a drug dealer. He has charges pending against him. Probably good reason for him to think it's the police. He lets them in and gets arrested without incident. Corey had no prior criminal record, um, was not a drug dealer. He did have a roach in the house, which would have gotten him a $50 fine under any other circumstance. He wakes up at 12.30 to sound of people breaking into his house. He uh, is terrified. He moves to the bedroom. Uh, he's got a gun that he keeps in the nightstand, takes the gun out, uh, sort of clutches it to his chest, lays down next to his, his little girl, and sort of hopes the noises will go away. They don't. They move around to the back of the house where the bedroom is. A few seconds later, the door flies open, a uh, figure dressed in black ascends the three-step uh, entry into the house. Corey fires three shots from his gun. One of them uh, gets under the officer's uh, bulletproof vest, pierces his abdomen. Uh, he bleeds out and dies on the way to the hospital. The officer Corey shot was Ron Jones, the guy who did the investigation. Uh, Jones was the ton of, son of the town police chief. Uh, Jones was white, Corey was black. This is a part of Mississippi that race was sort of a suffocating part of everyday life still is. Um, Corey uh, gets arrested. Actually, first he gets pretty severely beaten, then he gets arrested and charges capital murder, which is the knowing, intentional killing of a police officer. Now, I found Corey's case when I was writing a paper for the, my paper for the Cato Institute on this issue, and I'd read enough about these these, case, these raids at this point to know, you know, when I saw red flags. This story had been covered by the AP, been covered by all the local papers. It actually had been covered on the front page of the New York Times, um, but. The angle that the New York Times reporter took was that the drug war was sort of devastating the rural South and that the government wasn't doing nearly enough to crack down on it. And so the, when the New York Times reporter came down to Prentice and covered this story, the raid was basically black drug dealer shoots white cop. Uh, you know, here's another example of, of how terrible the drug war or the, the drug trade is. Um, I approached the story as somebody who was skeptical of these tactics and immediately struck me as, you know, the state's well, let's talk about Corey's. Here's what Corey says happened, right? He woke up in the middle of the night to people breaking into his home. Uh, he was terrified. He had, you know, there's no reason for him to think they were the cops. He's not a drug dealer. Door flies open. He shoots, kills one of, the, one of them. As soon as he realizes they're police, he surrenders. Their bullets still left in his gun, right? The state's theory was that Corey woke up, uh, looked out the window, saw a raiding team of police officers coming, decided to take them on, armed with only his handgun, waited for them to break in, shot and killed one of them, and then surrendered with bullets still left in the gun. Um, that did not seem very plausible to me. Um, you know, unless he had a death wish, uh, which the guy who, you know, had just moved in with his girlfriend and their 18-month-old daughter 
didn't seem to have a death wish, the kind of guy who had a death wish. Um, so the story struck me as something was very wrong about it. I started writing about it uh, on my blog. It kind of went viral on the internet. Um, a uh, young associate at the Covington and Burling Law Firm in D.C. read about it. Uh, he's got a daughter the same age as Corey's daughter, uh, sort of empathized with Corey, brought Covington on board um, pro bono. I, I'm not going to, I won't bore you with all the procedural details, but basically what happened is uh, a year later, um, a judge, uh, the trial judge threw out the death sentence of, uh, because of a um, uh, uh, insufficiency of counsel uh, argument. He had ineffective assistance counsel. Yeah, sorry. I, my vocabulary goes first as it gets later. Um, and he did he had a really terrible attorney. His um, family hired this woman in Jackson who sort of made it, played up the race angle. They actually would have been better off. The public defender down there was great, um, and they, they didn't want a public defender. Um, but uh, a couple years later, then the Mississippi Supreme Court uh, threw out the conviction. Uh, Corey was not allowed to argue at his trial that he was defending his daughter's life that night. The Mississippi Supreme Court said he should have been allowed to argue that. So they threw out the conviction. They also uh, gave, granted another one of his uh, 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 complaints that uh, basically his attorney, his bad attorney, uh, I think she had watched too many police TV shows. She immediately moved for a change of venue. Um, thinking that, you know, you killed a cop, you, we want this as far away from, well, actually what she did is she moved it from a, a county in Mississippi that was about 70% black to one that was about 80% white, um, and uh, basically kind of doomed Corey. So the S Mississippi Supreme Court also said that if court, the new trial would be back in Jefferson Davis County, and I think the prosecutors at that point realized that, you know, the best they could hope for at that point was a hung jury. Uh, they also used this corrupt medical examiner who uh, Matt mentioned in his introduction to me, who um, I just, it was sort of mind-boggling. The guy did 1,800 autopsies a year in Mississippi for about 20 years uh, from the basement of the funeral home, all by himself, actually. Um, I mean, the fact that he was being used over and over these cases just blew my mind. But they used him who, you know, as Corey's credibility was basically what was being argued before the jury, and he basically used some junk science to argue that the, the wounds and the bodies uh, in the officer's body the trajectory of the bullets proved that it couldn't have happened the way Corey said it does did. And, he, you know, he sound official and the jury bought it. Um, in any case, I think the prosecutors realized that they weren't going to get a conviction the second time around. So a couple years ago, they offered Corey a chance to plead guilty to manslaughter uh, and get, he would be sentenced to time served. Uh, so he'd get to go home to his kids and his family. Uh, by that time, he had been in prison for 10 years. Um, and this was a guy who, um, you know, this is a part of the country where I think not enough kids have good father figures. Uh, Corey doted on his kids. Uh, he was, um, you know, he, well, he was defending his daughter's life that night. Uh, but also, I mean, I, I think this is telling. Uh, I remember being in one of the hearings where the mother of the woman he, you know, got pregnant out of wedlock uh, testified as a character witness at his trial about what a great father he was to her grandkids. Um, and, you know, for all this, this guy was taken away from his kids for 10 years. Um, I remember, uh, I bring this up because this is the, the kind of poignancy of the story occurred to us at the homecoming party that his family threw up for him, uh, and this was uh, two summers ago. Uh, so they threw this big party for him, and you know, there's a big soul food buffet, and you know, Corey's taking his kids for rides on four-wheelers and kind of reconnecting with his daughter and his son. Um, and it's a very happy and joyous occasion, right? Everybody's ecstatic, you know, he's, he's home. Um, and rightly so, but you know, toward the end of the evening, his attorney and I were talking about this, and it, it sort of struck us as really sort of perverse that this was a happy occasion. Um, you know, here's a guy who hadn't broken any laws other than maybe recreationally smoking pot from time to time, wasn't doing anything wrong that night, uh, was woken in the middle of the night to the sound of people break, armed men breaking into his home, was put in this unimaginable position where he had to decide whether they were there to kill him or, you know, police who had made a mistake for some reason. Uh, made an error in judgment, which lots of police officers have made in these raids and are never held accountable for. Uh, and for that, he was, you know, beaten to within an inch of his life. Uh, for the next four years, the government tried to kill him. Uh, after that, he was transferred to the most violent wing of Parchment Penitentiary, where he served out the rest of his time. You know, they used a corrupt medical examiner to convict him. Uh, and at the end of all this, after 10 years, after 10 years of taking away from his kids and his family, you know, his, his girlfriend sort of moved on with her life, understandably so. He was... Basically, she did everything she could to sort of take his daughter out of his life while he was in prison. Uh, you know, after all of that, the state graciously allows him to plead to a felony, um, which, of course, you know, is going to follow him for the rest of his life. Um, and this was a happy occasion, right? This is one of the um, this is one of the happy endings. This is one of the stories that we sort of you know point to as like uh, an example where the good guys sort of won in the end. 
Uh, you know, in a just society, or in a society that we responded to this sort of government force in a way that was appropriate, I mean, I think a lot of people would have been outside, you know, courthouses with picket signs after this raid happened demanding that this guy get compensated for what the state had just put him through. Uh, and instead, we've become so comfortable with this, co with this idea. We've become so, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of jaded with the Castle Doctrine and, and accustomed to the idea that it doesn't really mean much anymore, uh, that this could happen to this guy uh, and the fact that after 10 years he gets released, we could see it as a victory. Um, I talk in the book about the term police state. I think it's a little bit overused. Uh, as I said at lunch today, if we truly lived in a police state, I would, I would be in jail for writing this book, and you probably would all be arrested for coming to hear me talk tonight. Uh, but for people like you know Corey May or Catherine Johnston or Sal Colosi, you know their one interaction with a police officer was life changing or life ending. Um, you know that was it was all encompassing. It was their entire world. Uh, so if you are one of the people who are unlucky enough to sort of have one of these confrontations, uh, you might as well be living in a blue state. If you happen to be somebody, who, you know, a black person who lives in one of the sections of New York where black people are getting, you know, you're getting stopped and frisked every five or six times you leave your house, you know, that, that isn't all that different from living in an actual police state. Um, so no, you know, I don't think we live in a police state, uh, but I also think it would be a mistake to wait until we actually get to one uh, to start to complain because, of course, by then it would be too late. So, uh, Aaron, would you mind telling your story? This happened three weeks ago in Mobile. Sure. Uh, some, some friends that I know, people I know, actually, um, they were actually in Mobile. And they were in Mobile. 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 And they both lay down for a nap and was awoken to the front door being, uh, you know, swung open and yells and screams to get down the floor, get down the floor. Well, being military police, we had an arm and they were efficient with And so as he rolled out of his bed, he first, his first response was to reach under his mattress to get the firearm. But as he rolled, he caught a glimpse of a law enforcement officer's badge. So as he rolled off the floor, he actually released the firearm and just stayed on his mattress to go take a look. Which saved his life. He could have easily went, went bad. And uh, once they, you know, figured out the, uh, that they were no threat, uh, they, of course, uh, he just wanted to know what the hell he was doing. You know, that's it. Uh, and the, the, the officer's response was that Somebody called in uh, a suicide call, saying that someone at that residence was going to commit suicide. Yeah. So they come in, you know, jump the wrong. <laughs> Nat Nat <laughs> the natural response. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I, I can't tell you how many suicide calls have was, ended with the police killing the guy. Of course, it was. It was they said that they knocked on the door or whatever, uh, and they said that the door was open, so they came on in. Uh, but uh, they swear that. Well, this is, I mean, this is, and this is a, a, a really scary trend that's sort of come out of all this, is that they're called, uh, people are referring to it as swatting. Uh, and the, SWAT, the use of swatting has become such a knee-jerk reaction now that if there's somebody you don't like, all you do, you, you call up, uh, you, you spoof, it's pretty easy to spoof a phone number, or you just use a cell phone and say, I just shot my wife. Uh, next thing you know, SWAT team is breaking down your enemy's door and possibly putting their lives at risk. Um, when they went to complain, that's exactly what the office said. That somebody had called her name? Uh, you must have made somebody angry or somebody has a grudge against you because of what had transpired. I got to, I mean, I've tried to get the NRA interested in this issue. I mean, if, I, if you're a gun rights person and I am, I mean, this should terrify you. I mean, if you have a gun in your home and the police mistakenly raid your house and you do what you have a gun in your home to do, uh, you're dead. I mean, they're going to kill you. You may kill one of them first, but they're going to kill you. Yeah. That's like the uh, story in May in Utah. There was a 39-year-old army vet who I think had really a criminal record. I want to say if I read this correctly. I, I've, I'm actually writing about this yeah, so I can give you all the details. Was it his ex-girlfriend who called and said yep. he's got 13 marijuana plants. I don't say whether there's a ceiling or this big. In yeah. his basement, the SWAT team Door, he kills one of them, wounds about five of them, and 
they arrest him. He ends up hanging himself in May of this year. Yep. In, in jail. This happened in January two years ago, yeah. Matthew David Stewart's the guy's name. I'm working on a long article about him. Um, yeah, he was a former veteran. I mean, he was, you know, he had some problems. He was socially, a little socially awkward, like, bought in. He was a, kind of a 9-11 truther sort. Uh, but, you know, he wasn't a violent guy, and basically a bitter ex-girlfriend turned him in for the pot plants he had in his basement, and they raided the place. And, that's right. Ended up in a shootout, and, you know, one cop's now dead, and Stewart... Uh, Stewart was going to argue self-defense, and then he lost a, um, a motion to have the, the search warrant declared illegal, and I guess he thought that sort of, you know, made it an uphill battle, and so you, they found him hanging in his jail cell the day after that motion failed. Well, you're talking to the Las Vegas, the guy in Costco. And, uh, uh, Eric Texas. Scott. There's also, there's also Jose Guarena in uh, Tempe, Arizona. This is another former veteran. Is Basically, his brother was involved in a lot of criminal stuff. He, there's no evidence whatsoever that he was involved. But the police had sort of tied him to his brother, and so they raided the place. And this guy was a former Marine, served two tours of duty in Iraq. I mean, you know he wasn't a drug dealer because he was working the graveyard shift at a, um, uh, uh, it was like an aluminum mine or something in Tempe. Basically, back-breaking work. Um, and, you know, the Tempe, SWAT, they sent the Tempe SWAT team to break into this guy's house in the middle of the morning, early in the morning. His son's in the house at the time. His wife's in the house. He puts him in a closet. He grabs his service issue. Uh, rifle. Uh, they break open the door. He's at the other end of the hallway holding the rifle. Uh, they open fire. Actually, what happened is one officer um, tripped, and another officer, this is their story anyway, claimed that he thought that many had been shot, so they all opened fire. Turned out, Garena, the safety was still on the gun. I mean, he had actually showed some trigger discipline. Um, the police officers just, you know, opened fire, kill him. Um, I actually showed, this is, I, Darkly amusing, I guess. I actually, there's video of that, a helmet cam video of that raid, and I actually showed it to a couple guys who um, not only did raids in Iraq and Afghanistan, but actually trained raid teams to seek out insurgents in, in Iran and Afghanistan. I showed him that video of uh, that raid, and he said, if, if that raid had been conducted in Afghanistan and Iraq, every member of the SWAT team would have been court martialed. <laughs> uh, I mean, basically, he said, there's no discipline, there's no, I mean, no training whatsoever, you know. Even in Iraq and Afghanistan, he said, you know, most of the time, there's some exceptions, most of the time he said that you surround the place, you get on a bullhorn, and you give the person, you know, every opportunity to come out and surrender before you go in, guns blazing. Um, I've actually heard this from other people in the military, too, that they, they agree with me on everything that I talk about, but they don't even like the word militarization because they say the military actually treats people better when they raid them than the police do in a lot of these drug raids. Future projects? Uh, my, well, I haven't, I'm, I'm working on a book proposal uh, about prosecutors uh, and prosecutorial misconduct and uh, sort of the lack of accountability for prosecutor misconduct. I figure I might as well just get all of law enforcement angry at me about it. So. <laughs> uh, yes, and then, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, let me let me let me put you a little bit at ease here. I mean, the odds of this happening to you are 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 you know almost infinitesimal. I mean, the, you know that this happens 100 to 150 times a day across the entire country, and it, and you know most of the time they are actual drug dealers that they're raiding. I mean, I think there's probably if I had to estimate, I mean, you know, police departments don't keep track of their own mistakes. So there's no sort of database of botched raids, but in terms of like you know media reports that I get, I'd say it happens about once a week they get the wrong house across the entire country. So the odds are this is never going to happen to you. I, I mean. Yeah, I, I would say still defend yourself. Um, I mean, I would say as soon as you. Well, here's. Well, let me let me let me make you let me make you even more nervous. <laughs> um, I mean, criminals have caught on to this now, and there are lots of stories now about criminals uh, claiming to be and dressing like police in order to get people to let them into their home, uh, basically pretending to be SWAT teams on a raid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I seriously don't. I, it's not gonna. I, it won't happen to you. I, I mean, uh, it's it's it's. I think. I mean, it, you know. I think it happens enough that we need. You know that, and it shouldn't happen. But I mean, the odds. You're. You know. You're more likely to be struck by lightning than to be the victim of a wrong wrong door drug raid. Just to say that the different in our 
primary schools you have been to, uh, and if you have been to the your training with you, please help us. So what these police officers or small town police officers in the one that you did back in the two was uh, from the actual parish that was being survived at work and oh, yeah. talking about whatever food uh, as he was. But they share the same mentality. And they became the same concerns, you know. But the thing about it is, it's hard to 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 not take that money. It's hard not to take that money. And it's definitely, if, if you're a, a person uh, like myself, I, I would want to get as much training as possible. So it was that initial goal. We did get training. And, and one thing that we kind of touched on, but uh, the government easily provides that training for Homeland Security. Actually. So they're, and also with the, the FBI. Uh, and so you, that mindset has been developed. But the but they don't give them in training on the equipment. I mean, the, when you get no, to the tank, like when you get it, you got it. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the military you have to go through hours and hours of training before you can drive a tank. Uh, if you're a deputy at you know whatever sheriff's department to get one through this program, you don't have to have any training before you get behind it. And we, and the other thing, just real quickly, we talk about training. We're talking about this at lunch today. Um, I mean. I've talked to a couple of people who train police officers. I, I'm assuming you train them like firearms handling and that kind of thing. Do you train them on actual like well, use I, of force? Or? I, I work for a, a private contractor here locally. Okay. Uh, and mainly what we do is we just share advice with everybody. Like the judge, the Johnson Police Department, they have a question. One thing I want to mention too is 25 years ago, the NRA did most of the training. Absolutely. Now it's the FBI. Yeah. And well, so it's a, they're getting a different street. But, but what? Quick into that. Well, they, over the years. But the other the other thing about the training, and I, I talked to I'm gonna, I think I want to write something on this. I talked to a couple of guys who have done use of force training for years and years, and and uh, you know they are really concerned about the sort of the direction that that training is heading. Um, so, for example, they said, you know, one of these guys said, you know, when he started doing this training, the emphasis was on de-escalation, it was on conflict resolution, it was on finding ways to settle disputes without violence. He said, basically, the, the overwhelming message you get from these courses now is how to justify the use of force after you've already used it. Uh, so now it's about covering, covering up your mistakes, not about how can we try to avoid using violence whenever possible. There's a group called the Force Science Institute that's based out of Minnesota that's probably the biggest training group in, in the country. Uh, they're used by police departments all over the country. And if you actually look through their classes and look through their newsletters, uh, it's all, it, again, it is all about finding ways to sort of retroactively justify the use of force. Um, One of the articles is when shot had to justify shooting somebody in the back. Just oh yeah. Well, there and there was one about. Yeah. I mean, there was one about. Um, and this is. I mean, this is. This is. I mean, this is so telling. Like there was one about. There was a cop who was. A car was rolling backwards toward him, uh, very slowly. Like basically, the person had taken off the brake or whatever, and uh, unknowingly. And the cop responded by opening fire and killing the guy. And uh, the cop was criminally charged. And the this four science institute was boasting about the fact that one of their experts testified at the trial about how, when you're a police officer in that situation. The car can you, the car can be appear to be going a lot faster than it actually is. Therefore, he was justified. And the guy got acquitted. Now, this is a, if you think about this, this is a group that's supposed to be training police officers on how to use the force. You would think that what they would do is they would say, "This is a cautionary tale about why we should train cops, you know, to be able to recognize, you know, when a car is sort of being driven at them versus when it's, you know, rolling at them slowly because it's on an incline." Instead. They spin it as, hey, look, we justified this cop killing this guy. <laughs> and, like, you know, I mean, they get more business. Yeah, so it's not a teaching, you know, it's not a teaching moment of, you know, here's, a, here's, here's something that happened and what can we learn from this so that we don't have to kill people in the future. It's here's how to kill people in the future and get away with it. <laughs> um, and I think that's a really sort of unfortunate direction that a lot of this uh, uh, has been moving up. Um, a, a lot of the training has been moving. And it's, you know, it's all sort of done. I mean, this isn't. You know, you can get copies of SWAT policy and sort of, you know, the police procedures and that kind of thing. It's much harder to get information on what's being taught at these use of force classes. Yes? <laughs> well, the problem is it. Right. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a government-created market. I mean, it's, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hardcore uh, libertarian, but I, I, I get in fights with my former employer at the Reason Foundation about uh, private prisons for the same reason. I mean, I, I understand maybe they're more efficient and, you know, but I just don't like the idea of having an industry that's created by government whose bottom line rests on perpetual incarceration. Um, and I don't like having an industry created by government whose bottom line rests on, you know, keeping police as much like the military or, or moving them as much toward the military as possible. Uh, I think you were being facetious with your question, yeah. <laughs> In Keene, yeah, yeah, that was where that, that's how I got that video uh, for the Lenko was in Keene, and they lost that fight, by the way, they, they ended up getting one anyway. I've, I've seen that argument a few times, the, the much more uh, likely argument is that we need this stuff because uh, you know criminals are armed like third world armies today and like we need to be you know it's an arms race and we have to stay ahead and there, that there's actually little empirical data to support that um, if you look at uh, even Justice Department studies on you know what kinds of guns are used in homicides it's overwhelmingly small caliber handguns um, so the idea that you know criminals today are armed with grenade launchers and you know um, uh, yeah, there's that, there's that, yeah, that argument too. Um, yeah, so there's just not much uh, validity to it. In fact, I mean, I, you know, the job of police officer is actually as safe as it's been uh, since the early 1960s. Um, you're actually more likely to be murdered just living in Nashville or Atlanta or St. Louis than you are to be murdered while working as a police officer. Um, now, you know, that's, that's not to say that when cops do get killed, you know, yeah, we, sh we should uh, not you know, be upset and compensate their families and treat them, you know, especially if they give their their, their lives, you know, trying to protect someone. Um, but, you know, when you continually tell cops every day that your job is one of the most dangerous in the country, which it's not even in the top 30, um, and you're constantly telling them that, you know, every interaction you have with the citizen could be your last, you know, that's going to affect the way they interact with people. They're going to start seeing people as potential threats and not as, you know, people they serve and citizens with rights. Um, and so, I, I mean, I try to emphasize it. it's always hard to make that argument without looking like you're sort of, you know, making light of the dangers that police officers face. But, you know, I mean, it isn't that dangerous of a job these days. I mean, if you're on the SWAT team, yeah, that is dangerous. Uh, but that's also, you know, because they're being used in the wrong situations far too often. Um, and, I'm, you know, there are some neighborhoods where it's dangerous. I, I told this story earlier today at lunch. I'll repeat it real quick. I mean, the mindset problem that I talk about that cops are seeing themselves as soldiers. I've, I've received some criticism that I'm exaggerating that. Uh, and I can tell you after the book came out, there's a website called Police One, which is where kind of the main activity of police, uh, where police go on the internet to discuss articles and so forth. So they commissioned a series of essays to respond to my book. Um, and one of them was written by the SWAT commander in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Uh, David French, I think was his name. Uh, and he basically just said, you're damn right I'm a soldier. Uh, I mean, you read it, I mean, it's sort of mind-blowing to read it. He talks about, you know, he doesn't refer to his beat, he refers to his sector. Uh, he doesn't refer to his job, he refers it to as his tour. Um, you know, he said, he, at one point he says the police officers today, their job is more dangerous than being an active duty soldier in Afghanistan, uh, which is just preposterous. I mean, the numbers aren't even close. And I mean, the whole thing is just defending the idea that he is a soldier and he goes to war every day when he puts on his badge. And, you know, this isn't just one guy's opinion. I mean, this is one of the essays that this main sort of hub of police activity chose as a representative response, you know, to the arguments I was making in my book. Um, and sort of the punchline to this is that Sterling Heights, Michigan is this very wealthy suburb of Detroit, uh, which uh, three times in the last 10 years has been named the safest city in Michigan. Uh, so this is, this is the city that this guy sees as a battlefield every day, you know, that he has to sludge through. Um, you just imagine if he actually worked in a dangerous neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if they're teaching it to the criminal justice students, to the 
the American society, I mean, not just people who are going into criminal justice, but just American society. It's a huge problem, yeah. And those, I mean, those traffic stop incidents, I mean, it happens once or twice a year. There are 750,000 active duty police officers in the U.S. I mean, the odds are infinitesimal that it's going to happen to a given cop, but those always make the news. They always get sort of, I mean, it's, I think it's a major problem. I, think, I mean, I think we need to stop telling cops that, you know, every time you go outside, you might be killed. I mean, it's just not true. And I mean, this goes back to, you know, this is, I mean, I'm a member of the media, so I guess I'm partly at fault, but the, you know, it's the, if it bleeds, it leads problem. I mean, Violent crime in America has been dropping dramatically since 1995. It's at historically low levels. It's actually one of the most amazing stories of the last century is just how far it's dropped and how quickly it's dropped. And nobody's really sure why criminologists are fighting over the reasons why. But if you look at opinion polls, Gallup every year does opinion poll. They ask people, is crime getting better or worse in this country? Every year, at least 60% of the respondents say it's getting worse. And they have been, even as it's been getting better. And the interesting thing is they ask a couple different questions. Everybody thinks their own neighborhood has been getting safer but crime's getting worse everywhere else in the country. And what that tells you is that things are getting safer everywhere, it's just that people are you know, watching the news and they're just assuming things are getting worse everywhere else. But this is why we get terrible crime policy, because people are think things are much, much worse than they actually are. Um, and so they support you know, sports metaphors, uh, you know, masquerading as uh, crime policy, uh, and these you know, very kind of simplistic approaches to crime that have gotten us to where we are. Um, I know you were sort of, your question was sort of, what do we do about it? And, you know, I have no idea. I mean, you know, I'm trying to sort of get the word out that, you know, about this. I think that's part of it is just kind of raising awareness and letting people know that, you know, um, things aren't as bad as they seem. And, like, we don't need this sort of hyper-militaristic response because crime's actually getting better in this country. Now, of course, the reaction, the response to that would be, well, it's getting better because of all the police militarization, right? Um, and... You know, I guess my response to that is, one, it's a convenient way to frame the argument because if you frame it that way, if crime's getting worse, you can say, well, see, we need to get tougher and we need more of this stuff. If it's getting better, you can say, see, all the stuff you gave us is working. We need more of it. Uh, you know, it's a way of framing the issue where you win either way, um, which is a, kind of a common approach. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same approach to the war on terror. You know, we haven't had a terrorist attack, therefore all this stuff is working. Um, if we have another terrorist attack, it's we need a lot more stuff. Um, but... SWAT teams, as I said, 75 to 80 percent of these SWAT raids are on people suspected of drug crimes. Drug crimes are the one class of crimes that actually haven't gone down since 1995. Uh, so I think I think you could argue that you know the area of crime where this sort of thing is most directed really hasn't gone down at all, which I think is a good argument that it's not particularly effective. Um, and you know, I, I don't think you can find a criminologist in the country who would try to argue that police militarization is why crime has gone down. I mean, there are lots of uh, you know, broken windows theory is, is, you know, people support that idea. Some people support the idea of just having more cops is good, which I, I think there's a lot of support for. Um, different policing strategies may have contributed to it, but I, I don't think you find a criminologist anywhere in the country that would say, you know, SWAT teams and, and having our cops act more like soldiers is the reason why crime has gone down. Uh, I've talked your ear off, so I'll, uh, uh, and I'm getting tired too, so. Um, thank you for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. All right, uh, next month we're gonna, uh, we'll be hosting Ilya Shapiro, uh, a senior fellow in uh, Constitutional Studies from the Cato Institute. He'll be discussing the recent Alabama case that was argued last week in the uh, United States Supreme Court on campaign finance. It's uh, McCutcheon versus Federal Elections Commission. Uh, and the plaintiff is from Birmingham, or from North Alabama, I think it's Birmingham. But uh, Ilya will be coming down. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, followed Ilya on um, Twitter, on Facebook, or on uh, the Cato site, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He actually attended oral arguments last week, so he's going to come back and report to us on the case and what he expects to happen. Once again, thank you all for all coming. This has been a fantastic event. Thank you, Bradley, for, for showing up and giving us a wonderful event. Thank you all. Thank you.